Some of you may have noticed the new addition to our family. Actually, we've had Penny for six months now already. I'm talking about the new to me F-150 that I just recently adopted. Of course, it isn't a person or a pet, but a vehicle can very much become a part of the family. But this is no newborn. No, this is what you'd call a used truck, a well-used truck. Some might even say it's a used up truck, but not to me. I cannot bring myself to pay $50,000 or more for a brand new truck. So I always buy used and usually high mild vehicles. But finding the right truck to bring into your family can be tough. I spent over three months looking for this truck, despite the fact that there are hundreds of them around. So in this video, I'm gonna share my five best tips for finding the perfect truck based on a strategy that I've developed over the last 30 years of owning more than a dozen or more pickup trucks. Right or wrong, this is just my opinion and it's what's worked for me. So your results may vary. Stick DIY. I can always relate a time period from the past to the vehicle that was present in my life at the time. When I was a kid, my dad drove International Scouts. He owned a few of them and he'd always drive them until you could see daylight through the floorboards. I remember many childhood trips riding on the rubber ribbed floor mat in the back of a Scout. For my wife's family, they had a salvaged and rebuilt Mercedes diesel wagon. That thing hauled them all around the United States, making vacation memories and racking up more than 400,000 miles through all those years. We were both taught that it didn't have to be new and there was lots of life left in a middle-aged vehicle. So we've never been afraid of buying used. Matter of fact, that's all we've ever bought. There were only two vehicles I've ever made payments on. One was my 5.0 Mustang I had in high school, and the second was a 94 Ranger I bought right after. But making payments gets old quickly, and it makes it really hard to save any money. So I started buying junky stuff in my early adult years. Of course, I had to fix up a couple of Scouts because Scouts were just such a natural fit to my family. And there's been a handful of old Ford trucks and Broncos too. If I had work to get done or wanted to do something fun and stupid, it was usually in one of those old Fords. Then there was the little Silver Ranger I had when we first got married. That thing did a ton of work for me and it never let me down. After about 10 years though in the workforce, I finally had saved up enough money for a real truck and I bought a high mild 99 Power Stroke before our kids were born. That thing was a beast and I really put in the work with that one too. But when diesel fuel hit $5 a gallon in 2008, I got rid of it. Then I got responsible when our daughters were born and I got a newer crew cab F-150. It only had about 108,000 miles and it was only five years old or so, so I felt like I was driving a new truck. I drove it a few years and then upgraded to the next generation of F-150 with this 2010 Lariat that had over 200,000 miles. Again, I didn't care about the miles because I was driving something that looked new. I felt as long as I was smart about what I purchased, I could probably drive it for a few years and then sell it without losing too much money. In 2015, I was fortunate enough to get a company truck with my new job, and that was the first brand new vehicle I had ever got to drive on a daily basis for both work and personal use. It was terrific, and actually the longest duration I have ever driven the same vehicle. I gave it back about a month ago with 107,000 miles on it, which means I drive about 13,000 miles a year nowadays. So even though at this stage of my life, I'm in a better financial situation than I was in my 20s or 30s, I still can't bring myself to spend $40,000 or more on a used pickup truck. It just feels irresponsible. I always buy used because I buy what I can afford without making payments. I set a budget that doesn't completely drain my bank account and leaves a little bit left over to pay for the unexpected. You know, I'm buying a used truck with no warranty and I'm taking on that risk. I understand it. Plus, there's other things I want to buy, too, like maybe a compact track loader, for example. So I figured I would employ the same strategy I had used when I was buying my own personal trucks, and it always worked for me, so why not do it again now? I set a personal budget of $20,000 and then began to look for something in the sweet spot. For me, the sweet spot is about a four to eight year old truck, which usually means you're going to get the previous generation of that truck. For example, in the F-150, the newest model is the 2021 and newer. That's not quite four years old yet, so that means they're gonna be pretty expensive. Even a truck with 20 or 30,000 miles is still gonna be 35 to $40,000. So that means with my budget, I'm probably gonna be looking for something in the previous generation, which was 2015 to 2020. For me, these two here are getting a little too old. This one was available from 2014 to 2009, and this one's 2008 to 2004. If you look at a 2010 F-150 with 50,000 miles and compare that 
to an equally optioned 2020 with 150,000 miles, it would likely cost about the same. I'd choose the 2020 because it's obviously newer, hasn't sat around idle nearly as long, and would likely hold close to its already depreciated value even over the next several years. So I've got my budget and my age range, which really narrows down the selection pool. Now I can give you my five tips for what I look for in buying a used truck. Number one for me is engine selection. I'm going to be looking for higher mileage trucks. And when doing that, I wanna pick an engine option that's the least complicated. In the Ford F-150s of the era I'm looking at, there are at least five different engine choices, if not more. There are two very sophisticated twin turbocharged EcoBoost options. There's a naturally aspirated V6 option. There was a Power Stroke diesel available. And lastly, there was a five liter V8. In my opinion, the best and least complicated for me is the V8. I think there's a pretty good consensus for this on the internet too. And even though the EcoBoost is arguably just as good and just as powerful, when it comes to high miles, I'm choosing the V8. Number two is trim level. I knew that at the very least, I wanted an XLT with the 302A option group. And I know that this means it has heated seats, the large touchscreen display, backup camera, and a few other goodies that I'm spoiled enough to not give up. I don't want to go backwards for my last truck, so I at least want to do a lateral move. It was an XLT. You should figure what trim level you'll settle for because that alone really helps narrow the field as well. I would really have liked to have found a Lariat, and it's possible because when you get into higher miles, it seems like the trim levels start to have less of a bearing on the overall price. Like you might be able to find a 200,000 mile Platinum in really nice shape, and it'll cost the same as a 150,000 mile XLT. So you can give up miles for luxury if you're willing. The only thing I gave up with an XLT over the Lariat was leather seats. And I know I can fix that problem if I get determined enough. Tip number three, is it privately owned or coming from a dealership? In this category and price range, I'm likely to not get a warranty from any dealer. So my personal preference is to buy from a private individual when you can. And preferably extra points for if you buy from the original owner. That could be huge. Because here's a couple reasons why. Buying from a private individual means you're not paying for a middleman to just detail the truck before they put it on a lot. So it'll be cheaper. Many high mile trucks that get traded in go to auction where they're bought up and flipped and you really don't have any idea how they were treated or where they came from. If you buy from an individual, at least you get to look the guy in the eye and get a feel for how he took care of the truck. And trust me, the truck's gonna tell you even if you think he's not being honest, which leads me to number four, the condition of the interior. To me, this is the best indicator for how the truck lived in its previous life. Think about it. If someone isn't willing to take care of the interior, the thing they look at and sit in every day, then how do you think they treat the things they don't see? If the interior is clean and free of markings and nicks and seat tears, then chances are they took care of the entire truck that way. I've looked at listings online where I can tell they worked really hard to try to make a dirty truck look clean. And all those little abuse marks just tell me to avoid that truck and it's just a giant red flag to me, especially in newer trucks. I can just picture those things being driven for 30,000 miles without ever having the oil changed, and the owner just trades it in on a new one. It, it happens. And that leads me to number five, it's mileage. My tip for mileage is that I'm not afraid of high miles. This is a prime example. We've got over 250,000 miles, 190,000 miles, 107,000 miles, 155,000 miles, and 42,000 miles. So if those five tips check out and the truck is in a color I'm willing to be seen in, then I'll go seek out a test drive. Of course, you're gonna wanna do all the normal test drive stuff to make sure there's no weirdness. Look underneath for leaks or dangling weirdness and check under the hood for things that look out of place. But really, unless you're a mechanic, what are you gonna be able to really identify other than making sure there's no check engine light on the dash? When driving it, you should be listening for any weirdness and feeling for any vibrations or handling weirdness. And on the outside, you can check the paint by looking for orange peel that seems excessive compared to the factory paint. That's a good sign or a way to tell that it's been repaired after an accident is when the paint texture isn't consistent across the whole truck. Okay, bought a truck. Time to head for home. The ad for this truck said all the right things that made me want to go look at it. It was a one owner truck. They said it was garage kept. And when I got there, one of the first things I noticed besides the mismatched tires was that there was one of those unlimited car wash tags on the windshield. And that's the mark of someone that cares about what their truck looks like. And sure enough, after meeting the owner, 
my assumptions were confirmed. And with the mismatched tires on there, I was able to get him to knock $1,000 off of his $18,000 asking price. So I came in $3,000 below what I had budgeted. That gives me some money to do some other stuff. And knowing that I'm not gonna put a lot of miles on this truck, I should be able to drive it for two or three years and get most of my money back as, as long as nothing terrible happens. The only thing I'm really not sure about is if I should have chosen black. I know I'll fight it to keep it clean, but man, they look good when they are. Plus the last four trucks I've driven have all been white, so I felt it was time to change it up a little bit. So what I've found is these trucks tend to bottom out in price. Once they get about 130 to 140 or 50,000 miles, they get to a certain level below 20,000 and then they just kind of stay there for a few years, especially if they're new enough. So my strategy, if you didn't notice, it's always been to buy a fairly new truck with high miles and then drive it three or four years and it'll kind of retain its value and then you can get away with selling it and only lose maybe three or four grand. You might drive the truck for $2,000 a year or less, which I think is pretty cheap transportation. Now, this obviously isn't without risk, like I said. There's always a chance that something can go wrong, but from what I've found, if you buy a new truck with high miles, then more than likely those miles were put on it quickly. The insides of these trucks are usually well taken care of because they're just highway trucks, and I don't know, I've had a good experience with it. So to me, it's a way to get into a newer model of truck for a lot less money, and that's what I'm all about. Okay, we're gonna go make memories in the F-150. We gotta go pick up the girls from school. You wanna go along? How was school? Pretty good. So this truck will be a part of the family for a couple of years at least, if not more. We won't put on a ton of miles, but we will certainly make memories. Just like the truck I was driving when I first got married or the truck we had when we had the girls, this will be the truck I had when I had to buy my own personal truck again after losing my company truck. Some family members stick around much, much longer and make tons of memories across many decades. All right, we're gonna fire up the Mercedes for the first time in several months. So they got something compromised, you think? Right there. Oh man, squirrels did a number. Yeah, and they got that chewed clear off. Okay. All right, we're gonna see if it moves still. There you go. That's when you guys were talking. That's what I was thinking. All you need is that. Third row seating. It's an 84, and I believe it's 405. 405,000. It had, I think, about 6,000 on it when we bought it. Five cylinder diesel, turbocharged. So you actually bought this car. It was wrecked in the front, right? Had a pretty hard hit. Real hard. When I first brought it home, I hooked onto it with the tractor and straightened the frame out, jerked it around the backyard, <laughs> and then took it to the body shop. So they put a new front clip on it? Yeah, yeah. And it had to have the engine block welded? Yeah, it had a hole about that big. It had uh, hit hard enough, it pulled the 
air conditioning compressor right out of the block. Jeez. So but, somebody came in, they had to, it's aluminum, right? So yeah, they had a guy from Dean Houston, guy from Hicksville came out to my shop and with a handful of cast iron rods and just used my uh, Lincoln welder and took about a half hour and it's never leaked a drop. So that's been good for about 400,000 miles. Yep. Yeah, he got me out of a pretty big jam because the new short block would have been way more money than we would have had. Yeah. Especially at that time. Okay, what's your most memorable memory of the yellow car? Um, probably Caleb getting his hair stuck in the window. <laughs> How about you? That one, and was it when we were going to Disney World, did the the air conditioning go out? What's your favorite memory of the yellow oh, car? Oh, taking the kids to school uh, mm. different times, and their friends always called it the banana mobile. The <laughs> banana mobile. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there's a lot of good memories there. And they forget their book bags, and I'd have to run them to school. Yep. And everybody always knew when I was on the road because there was no other car like it. Right. So, yeah. Was... Everybody knew it around town. I didn't even know you guys, and I was aware of the yellow banana. Ah. And we just lived across the state line, but we saw it go by every once in a while. Custard's last ride. Just like 30 years ago, huh? Yeah. Did you have a favorite memory to share of it? Oh, I don't know. Probably just the trip out west. Too many to count? Yeah. This concludes our services for the yellow car. <laughs> On to the next family. Person. Something. So you said that this car in 1984 was like a fifty-five thousand dollar car. Yeah. Yep. And who had owned it prior to you that you know? Uh, as I remember, it was a general in the Air Force that was serving in Germany, and he bought it over there and shipped it when he was his duty was done over there. You're kidding. He shipped it to the United States, and then his wife was making a left-hand turn into their driveway and turned right in front of somebody and had a head-on accident. It was, it was pretty ugly, pretty bad. That's, that's incredible. where he lived, I'm assuming down towards Indianapolis, because that's where I went and got it in the junkyard in Indianapolis. It was total. Mm -hmm. It can be really hard to say goodbye when something's been a part of your family for such a long time. I understand it. But some of that discomfort is eased a bit when you know that it's going to a new home where it's going to give, be given a new life by somebody that cares about it. And that's the case that's going on here. Still, a lot of memories. But at least we've got the video. Thanks so much for clicking on this one. I hope that you liked it. And if I'm lucky, I'll see you in the next one. What did you guys used to call the car when you were little? Why did you call it the quack quack car? When you started up, it was like quack 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 qu